Good morning and welcome to El Messias. I'm Pastor Amelia Beasley and I welcome you to our virtual worship space this morning. It is good to be with you to gather in the Lord's name on this, the Lord's day. And so friends, um, I invite you to come into this space as um, a people who are worshipful and ready to uh, encounter God. The truth is we can encounter God wherever we are not just in the church building, but in our own hearts. And so friends, I would invite you to take just a moment to prepare your worship space today. I have lit a candle here uh, to help uh, draw um, our attention to the light of Christ. Friends, if you have a candle in your home, I invite you to light that candle as a symbol of Christ with us, uh, with you in your space this morning. I also want to let you know that we will be starting a new opportunity for gathering in addition to this worship service, and that that will begin at 930 this coming Sunday, November 1st, and we are going to have that worship time via Zoom teleconferencing. Now, some of you may be familiar with Zoom. You may use it in your workspace, and so um, it will work just like you're uh, accustomed to. Um, if you would rather join via audio and not video, you can do that. There's a telephone number that you can call that will put you in connection with the audio. If you need help um, accessing Zoom, please give me a call. I will walk you through the process. It's very simple and we can get you connected. This worship time on Sunday, November 1st, is going to be an All Saints Remembrance. We're going to be remembering and praying for the people who we love who have passed on this year, our saints who now rest in glory. We will take time to remember with one another, to pray, to share, and to light candles um, in their honor. I invite you to join us 9.30 on Sunday, November 1st, uh, to be a part of this special time. We also will continue meeting after November 1st uh, for a few weeks just um, to have a time of fellowship and some Bible study. But then in December, or at the end of November rather, we will begin our Advent study with one another via Zoom platform. This gives us a time to be live with one another, to see each other's faces and to hear each other's voices as we um, spend time at home uh, practicing uh, safe distancing so that we can um, get through this pandemic together uh, safely and, and in a healthy way. We also will be having Holy Communion on Sunday, November 1st. You can pick up your communion elements at the church on Saturday morning, October 31st from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. You can do that by calling the church office. Someone will be there to answer the phone and letting them know that you're on your way. We will continue to do this until we meet in person again. Uh, we also uh, would invite you to invite your friends and your neighbors to uh, be a part of the communion uh, if they would like to be. Uh, you can pick up packets for them and drop them off in safe ways so that they can participate in the liturgy that we include with the packets. But also, if they'd like to join us um, at 11 in this worship space, they can do that as well. We are continuing our Walking with Jesus series, and today we're talking about giving. And so today I invite you to give God your heart and prepare your heart and mind to be in a place where God can reach you so that you can serve God with all that you have. Let's take a moment now to pray and enter into this time of worship. God of grace and God of glory, you are our light and our protector and our God in whom we trust regardless of our worldly status. Humble our hearts so that we may acknowledge that it is only in your presence that we can find life's balance and perspective, and that only in your holy presence we can know true acceptance and our true home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome to worship. Sky. Por 
Our scripture readings this morning come from Matthew 6, 19 through 21, Luke 12, 15, and 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Luke twelve fifteen. And he said to them, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. 1 Timothy six seventeen through 19 As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. 
They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of the life that is really life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We've been getting a lot of catalogs in the mail lately, and this weekend, Martin and Wilson spread out on the floor with the Target toy catalog. They went through every single page, mentally circling Super Mario Brothers Lego sets, Minecraft play sets, Nintendo Switch games. Every five minutes or so, Martin would come running into the kitchen where I was cleaning, shouting, Mommy, wouldn't it be cool if we got this? Pointing to a new toy every single time. Then he'd run out of the room again to peruse the catalog some more. I can only imagine in his mind what a bounty this catalog was. I thought back to a podcast I'd listened to a few days earlier. The host and her guest were discussing a scenario in which children ask their parents for toys every time they go to the store. Has this ever happened to you? It has to me. I also remember doing this to my mom when I was a kid in Walmart. The guest on the podcast remarked that her mother never said we can't afford that when denying her request for the toy in the store. Instead, she would say, you don't need that. Already, she was preparing her children to make choices for themselves. Instead of painting a picture of scarcity, we can't afford that, we don't have the money, her mother gave her the opportunity to make a value judgment, to ask herself at even a very young age, what do I actually need? It's a simple question. That's terribly hard to answer for many of us. From catalogs to ads on social media and email and TV, we are bombarded with the push to buy more, to seek pleasure, to avoid boredom or discomfort or disappointment. This pleasure seeking is called hedonism. Hedonism was a Greek philosophy that sought to maximize pleasure and to minimize pain at all costs. We often hear this word used today to describe licentious behavior such as excessive drinking and gambling. One problem with hedonism is that it puts the act of avoiding pain at the center of our lives. It makes avoiding pain our main priority instead of following Jesus. And Jesus never said there wouldn't be some pain along our discipleship journey. Another problem with hedonism is that one's needs are never fully satisfied with material pleasures. Humans always want more. And when the thrill of the hunt is over, the pleasure one obtains from that one thing loses its power. Have you ever noticed this? You decide you want to purchase something really nice for yourself or for your family. Or maybe it's just something you've wanted for a long time. Maybe it's a new car or a new TV. Maybe it's a pair of shoes. You think about it, you, maybe you even dream about it, and when you finally get it, the newness wears off pretty quickly. The dreaming about it may even have been more thrilling than the actual item that you purchased. The joy of owning this item evaporates, and you begin to want something else to take its place. This phenomenon is called hedonic adaptation. What does this say about us as humans? What value judgments should we be making in order to avoid the emptiness that hedonism eventually brings? A few weekends ago, we cleaned out some closets and moved the boys into a room together so that we could create a playroom for them. I was tired of stepping on toys in the living room. As I organized their new playroom, I began to sort the toys into various piles, keep, throw away, and give away. All those home organization shows I've watched finally paid off. I placed the giveaway pile in a box and I put it in the van to take it to the donation place. 
When Martin climbed in and saw the toys in the back, he asked, Mommy, what are you doing with my toys? I said, those are toys you don't play with anymore, and I think it would be nice to give them to some children who don't have any. What do you think? He thought for a moment and said, it's sad that some kids don't have toys to play with, so I don't mind if you give my toys away. I told him that I was proud of him for being such a kind person. But I was really proud that Martin was able to make a value judgment. He knew what he needed and the trade-off for giving away the excess, the joy of generosity. We've all heard the phrase, it's better to give than to receive. But did you know that this is a verse in the Bible? The Apostle Paul, in the book of Acts, attributes these words to Jesus when he's talking about the importance of caring for the weak or the poor. In his letters, Paul urges the churches to whom he's writing to be generous and to collect money for the believers in Jerusalem who are very poor. He doesn't just see generosity as a nice thing to do. Paul writes to the Galatians in chapter 5 that generosity is a fruit of the Spirit. Generosity is brought about by the Spirit's work in the heart and life of the believer. Generosity comes from the power of God's grace. It's a product of holiness when God's grace moves into our hearts and transforms us into people who look a little more like God. Holiness is the antidote to hedonism. If hedonism is seeking out the pleasures of the world to avoid pain, holiness is seeking out the pain of the world and attending to it with generosity. When the Holy Spirit moves within us, we experience the living God at work in our lives. This is the same God who created the universe, from planets to molecules. Psalm 24 tells us the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and those who live in it. This God who created the world out of abundant love also created human beings for God's own pleasure, to live in loving relationship with God. The generosity of God created the whole universe and us. When human beings failed to live in loving relationship with God, out of abundant compassion, God sent his son to show us what love truly is and how to practice it. And when people still didn't understand, Christ poured out his life as a sacrificial act of love on the cross so that the whole world would not perish but have eternal life and have it abundantly. God didn't have to do that. But God gives abundantly and without condition because that is who God is. God is generous with his love and grace. And if we're to walk with Jesus on this journey as faithful disciples, we should do all we can to practice this generosity as well. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, was concerned about the wealth Methodists were amassing. He wrote in his thoughts upon Methodism, the Methodists in every place grow diligent and frugal. Consequently, they increase in goods. Hence, they proportionately increase in pride, in anger, in the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, and the pride of life. So although the form of religion remains, the spirit is swiftly vanishing away. Which way, then, I ask again, can we take that our money may not sink us to the nethermost hell. There is one way, and there is no other under heaven. If those who gain all they can, and save all they can, will likewise give all they can, then the more they gain, the more they will grow in grace, and the more treasure they will lay up in heaven. John Wesley understood that the more wealth we attain, the harder it is for us to stop seeking more. The truth is, though, that there will never be enough wealth to satisfy us. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus told the rich young ruler that although he knew the law, if he didn't give up his wealth and possessions to the poor, he wouldn't enter the kingdom of God. 
The scripture tells us that the man became very sad because he was very rich. The problem, however, was not that he had lots of wealth. It was that he couldn't part with it in order to follow the kingdom of God. When Jesus himself asked the man to do it, he couldn't. It was a much greater loss than he was willing to take. And this was John Wesley's point. When wealth takes the place of Christ's direction in our lives, when it becomes our highest priority and that which governs our decisions and actions, then we aren't growing in holiness. We're not growing in grace. We may be gaining wealth, but we aren't producing fruit. In short, we are not following Jesus. We're serving wealth instead of God. And Jesus tells us in Matthew 6, 24, you cannot serve both God and money. Pastor and author Adam Hamilton puts it this way, which serves which, your wallet or your Bible? In the end, we're given a choice. We make a value judgment. What do we need? What do we have? And how can we give to God and to our neighbor? In John Wesley's view, the more we gain and the more we save, the more we have a storehouse from which we can give to those in need. Our storehouse gets larger, and yet our proportion of giving gets larger as well. And so the things that we have come from God, and we give those things out of goodness and kindness and generosity that are the fruits of the Spirit growing in us as we grow in grace. So I'm going to challenge us. We've been operating on the principle of five over the past few weeks. Pray five times a day. Read five scripture verses a day. Perform five acts of kindness. And now I'm going to challenge us to perform five acts of generosity a week. Five acts of generosity. Giving out of what you have. Maybe that means buying something. Maybe that means giving your time and your talents. But it ultimately means giving of yourself for someone else's benefit. I'm also going to challenge you to include the church in your acts of generosity. Times are hard for many of us financially, but when we make giving to God a priority, which we do through the local church and in our personal lives, we find that many of our priorities are misaligned. Giving to God first sets the tone for the rest of our value judgments, where our heart's treasure lies and what we truly need. It helps us to recognize who the source of our blessings is, the God of all creation, who has given us life on earth and the promise of eternal life. When we understand that our lives do not consist in the abundance of possessions, we are unburdened from the never-ending search for satisfaction, and can embrace the abundant life God offers us in Jesus Christ. When we are generous, we live into our call as disciples, and the fruit of the Spirit begets more fruit. And that fruit is joy. May we give generously so we may be unbound from the burden of hedonism and step into the freedom of holiness. Amen. Friends, as the people of God, we're invited to pray. Praying is a part of how we offer ourselves as servants to God. Prayer realigns our hearts with God's heart, and it gives us compassion for those for whom we pray. This includes people whom we would rather not pray for, <laughs> our enemies, those with whom we disagree, those who just need a little extra grace from us. And so prayer helps us to realign with the compassion and love that God has for us so that we can pour it out for others. So let's take this time now to pray with one another in the comment section so that we can share together as the body of Christ.
prayers for our world, our nation, our community, and our church, and for our families as well. Let's do that now.
Please join me in prayer as we prepare our hearts and minds for our offering. Beloved God, who richly provides for our needs and enjoyment, thank you for your many gifts. You have trusted us with our lives, with this world, and with your love. May the gifts we offer you today be used for your service and your glory. Help us store up for ourselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, that we may take hold of the life that really is life. We offer these gifts, trusting in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. First Timothy talks about releasing your heart from the bondage of wealth. That when we align our hearts and follow God as our first priority, that we can take hold of the life that is truly living. We can fully live into who we are when we are only bound by the love and grace of God and nothing else. And so I invite you, friends, into this walk 
of generosity. To allow God to open your heart with the spirit of generosity so that you can step into joy, the joy of giving and the joy of serving God through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Take hold of the life that is really living, the life that we can only find when God is our sole treasure. Where our treasure is, there our heart is as well. So I invite you to make God your treasure and allow God to show you what life is truly about. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you.